a great guest for you today, but first I'd like to start with an introduction to the webinar software. Helen? Thanks, Lara. Hi everybody, it's Helen here from Magpie Media. Just a couple of things I want to cover off with you today about uh, your control panel that you've got there in front of you. Now you can use that uh, to interact with the webinar today. So if you've got any questions, uh, either technical ones for that I can answer for you or questions for the presenters, all you need to do is type them into that little box and send them through and we'll deal with them. One other thing, if you happen to lose your connection today for any reason, all you need to do is click on your link and it will bring you back into the webinar. Uh, the webinar will also be recorded and a copy made available for viewing later. And that's it from me. Thanks, Lara. Thank you, Ellen. Okay, so just as a reminder, you've been invited to this webinar today because you are a client of Jason's who has opted into both a print and a web package. It is a privilege of our package clients to be able to attend our webinars. We do six webinars a year, and this is number three of the 2011-2012 year, and it is on the basics of search engine optimization, or getting found online. Today our speaker is Simon Laird and he joins us from First Rate, which is a um, search engine optimization company based in Auckland. And um, welcome Simon. Thanks Lara. I um, hope everyone's doing well out there today. Um, as mentioned, my name's Simon and I'm coming to you from First Rate. Um, who you just heard was of course Lara. Um, so what we'll do first of all is just a quick introduction to who First Rate is. Um, so we are part of the Q group or a QXQ group. Um, First Rate itself was founded in the year 2000, so we've been doing this for uh, 12 years now. And we're one of the first people in New Zealand to really get on board um, and start working with SEO and um, other, other online marketing channels. So we now exist across Australia and New Zealand as part of a larger group where we have uh, web development, we have um, digital strategy, um, a whole bunch of different uh, online marketing options and we've got currently about 70 plus clients uh, between our Sydney and Auckland offices. Um, we were the first Google AdWords and Analytics uh, qualified company to be trans-Tasman, um, so that means we've gone through and passed a whole bunch of the exams that Google sets for people. and. That's really just a, a, yeah, a sign that we're working closely with them and that we're on sort of the top of the game when it comes to <laughs> dealing with online search. So that's probably enough about us. Uh, we'll get on to what we're, our main topic is today. So SEO, search engine optimization, uh, the, the, what we're really talking about here is we're making changes to your website, both on page and off page, um, to help improve your rankings in search engine results. So currently Google's algorithm has over 200 different ranking factors when it's taking into, uh, when it's taking all the sites that's ranking into consideration. So what we're trying to do is figure out how many of those we can help optimize your site for to help improve your rankings. Um, now there's quite often a lot of, well, bad news or um, sort of uh, negative press about SEO and that sometimes it's uh, you know a lot of people say it's just a spammy practice or it's a you know it's it's bad now that can be true when you do it wrong but in reality what we're trying to do is we're making our sites better for search engines but also for people so by improving the way that users use the site we're actually making it better for search engines as well and we're helping people get the most on the information that they want out of your site so they can help convert through you. Um, so how do we do it? Now we already, I already mentioned the two different main elements is on page and off page. So on page is changes to the technical elements on the site. So it's actual changes at the code level. Um, on top of that we can be talking about how we change the actual content or the text that's appearing on the pages. And of course we want to be adding a lot of new content. Uh, because of the way that search engines work, uh, content is like their, is pretty much like their food. That's what they read, that's what they consume. So we want to be giving them as much of it as possible. 
When it comes to off-page, um, we've got two different aspects there. Now, link building um, helps determine your site's authority on the web. We'll go into that a little bit deeper a little bit later on. Um, but the new sort of emerging exciting part of our industry right now is the social interaction with search. So how Google and other search engines take into account things like Facebook and what you're sharing there or Google Plus, um, how people like content or um, you know provide votes for content through that. So the first step that we need to look at when we're talking about SEO is finding the right keywords. So really everything that we do in SEO is going to revolve around making the correct keyword choices right at the start. Uh, if we're optimizing our site for phrases that people aren't actually searching for, it's a bit of a waste of our time because nobody's actually going to find the site. And on the other hand, if we're optimizing, you know, if, if we're a particular site that's unlikely to rank for a certain keyword. We want to make sure that they're relevant so that we do actually stand a chance of appearing in those search results. So to do that, um, we need to think about some different types of keywords. So there's head terms and long tail. Now what we generally tend to say is the head terms are your really popular generic phrases. So we're talking about things like accommodation, or hotels. Um, so these have really high volume because a lot of people are searching for them regularly, but they are significantly less targeted and they're, because so many people are searching for them, they're very competitive, uh, which makes it quite hard to rank. So now, what kind of sites, Simon, would rank on, on the, those kind of head terms? Um, so what we want to, yeah, the types of sites that we want to rank for those. So you might find um, your really high authority sites are able to compete on those more and sites that are targeting a wide range of areas or locations. So things like um, your, your what-ifs, your um, Expedias and your Jasons are the ones that mm -hmm. are going to be appearing across those more head terms because they have the authority or the weight behind their site that they can really reach out and grab those results. Okay. Um, now, on the other end, we have the long tail. So this is, um, there are more phrases here. So there are, there are thousands of different variations. So you might think about people who are searching for uh, you know, accommodation in Rotorua would be one variation of a head term. But when we think about two bedroom accommodation in a certain suburb of Rotorua or uh, you know, thousands of different variations around that where people are adding to their search terms. Now, there are less searches for these on an individual basis, but because they're so much more targeted and because your sites, uh, you being the operators, are so focused on specific areas, it's going to be a lot easier for you to target these and draw the most relevant traffic for you. And now, this is because their sites aren't as big or aren't maybe linked to as by as many places or changed as frequently as larger sites like news sites or online travel agencies. That's right, um, but it's also just because you are so focused on one specific area, um, you know, a lot of the time. So if you are that accommodation provider in Rotorua, um, you know, it, it's people searching for accommodation are unlikely to just want to see Rotorua accommodation, mm -hmm. they're probably looking for a broader range. Whereas if somebody types in, uh, you know, Rotorua motel, um, then it's a lot more, you know, that, that makes a lot more sense for you to be appearing alongside that term. Sure. Um, so yeah, we want to be targeting a wide, uh, you know, probably a lot of the people here today are going to be wanting to target the, uh, the longer tail and picking that up. Um, I mean, we should always be aiming to get um, uh, some progress across those head results as well, but for a lot of people, they're going to see a lot more results and a lot better results from targeting the long tail. Uh, it's also important to note that when people are going through the search progress, a lot of people will start off on a more generic term, like we were saying before. So they might start off with New Zealand accommodation. Mm -hmm. As they get closer and closer to booking, they're more likely to refine their searches so that they start, you know, then once they know they want to visit Rotorua, they start uh, searching for that. Or once they know that they want a two-bedroom place, they start looking for that one as well. So, so appearing on those... Reflected in some, 
Oh, sorry. This is reflected in some recent research we did, so it's really interesting that you bring that up. Uh, Jason's, we recently did some research where we were asking people who had visited our website or who had ordered our guides um, where they started and then where they ultimately ended up booking. And um, while a lot of people started searching on our site and many of them ended up booking straight there, there were also quite a few who found what they were looking for and then went off and did Google searches for more specific things such as the property name or specific areas yeah. or features. Yeah. Yeah. So the property names especially, but also yeah, the um, more refined or targeted you can keep yours, uh, the better because you're more likely to grab that really relevant, really close to converting traffic. Mm -hmm. All right, so how do we find these keywords? This is where we've got some quite cool tools from Google available for us. Um, so this one is fairly simple, simply called the Google Keyword Tool. Now it's actually an AdWords add-on, um, so their SEM or Search Engine Marketing Interface add-on, um, where you can help add keywords that you want to bid on. But it's also quite good for targeting um, or figuring out what people are searching for for SEO as well. So um, in this instance, uh, what we've got here is we've got, uh, we're inserting the word accommodation just as an example. And we can see that for that, we're getting a total of 1,220,000 odd searches per month in New Zealand are based around just accommodation. Um, now, that, that's a fair amount just in, inside of New Zealand, but if we're looking at that internationally, it's 151 million. So we can see why we're saying these are highly competitive terms. If you want to be appearing across that, it's, no, that's a and lot of exposure. Especially because there's only about, what, 20, 20 spaces on the homepage? Or how many spaces? Something like uh, that. 10, really. I mean, there's 10 official sort of placements, but because of the changes uh, with local search, we're seeing that varying a lot more at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we can see there uh, there's 122, oh, sorry, 1.22 million sitting there. Now it's important to note a couple of tips in here. Um, you can see there we can change the location that we want to target. We can change the language that we want to target. We can also change whether we want to look at desktop computers or mobile devices or a, few, a whole lot of other um, options in there. Now, what you would do is generally put in a whole lot of phrases that you're interested or that you think are relevant to your business. You can plug those into the tool and it will spit out a whole bunch of information on exactly those terms, but also a whole lot of terms that it thinks is, would also be relevant. So it's worth looking through those and then just evolving your search all the time to figure out what the ones that are most relevant but have the most volume are. Now, there's another trick for young players here. Um, you can see over this side, we've actually got some different match types. So the match types make a huge difference into, in terms of how much information they're actually showing you. So broad matching means that anyone who's searched for accommodation anywhere in their search phrase or any terms that Google has identified are really closely related to accommodation are included in that local search, uh, local monthly searches figure. Now if we change to exact, then we would be able to see exactly how many people searched for just accommodation. Phrase is a mix of the two, so it's if people used that, uh, that phrase, um, but they used, um, but it, it only appeared somewhere inside of their search term. So if somebody searched for you know, New Zealand accommodation, because it's appearing inside of that search phrase, it would still count as being a phrase match. Uh, whereas if somebody searched for New Zealand accommodation and we had the exact matching, it would not be included in that number. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Brilliant. So yeah, I really recommend that everyone jumps in and has a play around with this tool. It's really um, interesting just to see what people are searching for, if nothing else. Uh, it gives you some really interesting information and it, it, it allows you to actually export lists and uh, a whole bunch of other different, um, different sort of 
functions that, are, that make it a really interesting thing to have a play around with. Now you can find it in Google just by searching for Google Keyword Tool. Uh, and for anyone who's stop. interested, oh sorry, and for anyone who's interested we've included more information about this in the white paper about um, that will be sent out following this email and will also be available at myjasons.co.nz. Okay. Um, so I've got another little interesting tool here. Now this one's uh, Google Insights. So what this one does is it actually plots search volume uh, on a graph. Now it's not an exact, uh, when it shows you the graph, it's not an exact amount of search volume. It's all relative on a scale of 1 to 100. But what it does is it shows you comparatively how much traffic some phrases are getting compared when we compare one to another. And it's also fantastic for showing seasonal trends. So in this example, we can see that uh, New Zealand accommodation is definitely getting more, uh, more search volume. Um, but New Zealand hotels and motels, uh, also we've got them sitting there side by side as a comparison as well. So it shows you sort of the different levels of search volume that those are. So accommodation has a lot more searches doing, done for it than motels, for example, or for hotels. Um, but it also is interesting to see that big spike in January. Um, so you know we can see that the search volume around then is really fantastic. Now for SEO, this isn't. Um, you know, this is good for just doing comparisons. But if you're doing AdWords or uh, other online marketing, or you know, any any sort of marketing that you're doing. It's really good to see this, that people are interested in January. Now a lot of you are already going to know that from, because it's your busy period, but it's really good to see uh, some other seasonal trends and all going on here as well. I also see there, and this struck me the first time I looked at it, there's an ongoing decline um, over the last three years, and that looks like it's almost reflective of the recession and the decline that's happened in uh, tourism as the dollar here has risen. Yeah, definitely. So it's, I mean, we can go back and see sort of the last about 10 years worth of data. So it's really good for seeing, um, you know, ongoing trends like that one. But yeah, you're dead right. We can see that uh, the actual search volume, we were sitting at on average, let's say in about the middle of the year, we were sitting on about 80 out of a relative, you know, 100. And we're now sitting at about 50 in the middle of 2000. So, I mean, that, that's a fair drop there. So just less people are out there searching. Um, because Is that there are also reflective of a change in habits? Like, are people searching differently than they used to? It is. So there's two different parts of this. One, it makes it helps to show you that people, you know, it's, it is important to be appearing there and even higher up than ever because if less people are searching, the higher you are, the better you are off you are going to be. But it's also interesting to see um, over recent years the usage of these head terms, so the big New Zealand accommodation ones, is dropping off as people become more intelligent about how they search. So now they search for um, more targeted, they do more searches around focused keywords and those longer tail ones than they have been in the past. Interesting. Mm. So between those two tools we should have access to um, you know, the right keywords. Uh, so the next thing we go on to is how we use them. Um, so here we've got a poll question. So are you currently managing your property's own website or are you having it done by somebody else? So I think Lara. Helen I think is going to pop up a poll there. I think she just did. And um, if everyone can just click on the appropriate answer for uh, what you're doing at your own property. we just like to get a little bit of information so we've got some context for our conversation. I'm watching the numbers now and they're very, very close to a 50-50 split, but only 75% of people have voted so far. Oh, interesting. That's quite a high number of people who are managing their own. Yeah, it is. I'm surprised by that. It's really good um, to see people taking that sort of level of interest and in, um, managing it themselves. Okay, so here's what we have, Simon. It's 49% it's are managing their own website and 51% wow. are having it managed by someone else. So okay. your context here for the following slides will be that all of you who are managing your own website 
these things that Simon is going through for the next section are things that you can be doing yourself and for the other half. These are the things that you should be talking to your website supplier about and having conversations about. That's exactly right. So, I mean, we'd like to think that uh, all of our developers are building the best possible sites uh, they can, but in a lot of cases, uh, a lot of them don't actually know uh, that much about SEO and how it works. So, if you're, um, so we're just about to run through a couple of the technical things that you can change on the site for the on-page SEO. Now, the first thing is title tags. These are the uh, pretty much the naming system of, of your pages on the site. Now, every time you do a search in Google, the blue text that you see in the listings, that's the title tag that's being grabbed uh, off your page. Now, this exists in the code, and it also exists um, if you're using your browser, then it's generally the name of the page that appears up in the, uh, at the top as well, um, sort of at the browser level, not on the actual page itself. So a good example of a, um, a title tag, let's say uh, you are ABC Motel in Hamner Springs. Now, what we have identified is that Hamner Springs Motel is going to be the right keyword for us to target with one of our main pages, let's say our home page. Um, we've figured out that we're likely to rank on this because it's relevant enough to us, but we've also, uh, it's getting enough search volume that that makes it a worthwhile keyword to target. So we're just going to include uh, in this one, uh, we're, we're putting the keyword first and then we're putting our business name at the end. Now it's important that we do keep our business name in there because we want people who are actually searching for us directly to note, to recognize us and for that to show up in the search results. Um, couple of key points when you're writing your title tags. We want to keep them to about 60 characters. Uh, but anything more than that and Google will start to truncate it or chop it off. Uh, so anything that appears after that will be a little bit useless for the people who are reading it in the search results. The search engines okay, are going to Simon, continue. Something that I'm noticing is that you're using the word keyword, but it's not actually one word. Sometimes it's phrases. Yeah, that's right. So keywords and key phrases, we use uh, we use those terms interchangeably. Um, I mean, when we're talking about a keyword, people, it's we're thinking about what people are entering into the search box. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, Google will read up to. Uh, I think it's about 100 or 80 or 100 characters, um, but it's only those first 60 that really matter because they're going to be the ones that show up in the search results. Um, some bad examples of those, if you've just got home or something like that written there, or just uh, page one, page two, page three, uh, really brief or not very descriptive title tags, that's going to be detrimental to you. And also, if you just target something like Accommodation New Zealand, uh, like we've sort of already discussed, it's unlikely that you're going to get rankings for that unless you're doing some fairly advanced optimization work um, and have a really high authority site. Like you were saying, um, with this, with SEO being for search engines and for people, uh, I can think about just landing on a search page. And when I land on a search page, I definitely think that something that's a call to action or something that's a little bit more descriptive is the header or the, the search link that gets my attention. Yeah. Um, so yeah, making it stand out a little bit or just making sure that it's super relevant to what the users are actually searching for. Now, what that means is we don't want to target all of our search phrases or our, our keywords with just one, uh, just one page. We want to use all of the pages across the site to actually target those. So you might realize that Hamner Springs Motel is one of them. You might find out that uh, people are using a slightly different search term to find the, uh, or, you know, as we said, you've got the two bedroom places or the three bedroom places. On your two bedroom page or your three bedroom page where you're talking about those individual accommodation options, you should be including that keyword there um, in the title tag as well and in all of these elements that we're talking about today. We want to make sure that all of our title tags for each page on our site are different and they're descriptive, but also using keywords. Cool. Um, the next one that we look at is the meta description tag. Now, this is another one that doesn't appear 
on the page at all. It's in the code and it's read by search engines. So what it is, is it's meant to be a description of your page. Uh, now what you'll often find is that this is the little section of black text that appears underneath the uh, listing in the search results page. So it's worth optimizing that a little bit to make sure that it's using keywords so that it's been, uh, you might have seen it in the results if you include the keyword in there then it will actually bold that text which makes it stand out a bit more. But it also gives you a chance to have a little bit of an advertising sort of space sitting in there. So in this case we've said a good description would be ABC Motel in Hamner Springs offers a range of accommodation options. It's just two minutes walk from the world famous Hamner Springs Thermal Reserve. So in that example, I mean, it's again a made up place, but they're emphasizing some of the good parts about their business, uh, making it a little bit more attractive for people who are looking through the pages of results. Uh, they're more likely to click on stuff that stands out a little bit. So what we want to do here is keep them to less than 160 characters. So it was 60 for title tags and 160 for meta descriptions. Um, so if we keep to that, then again you won't get the end of it chopped off. I think that one there, to give you some idea, is about 150 something characters long. So that's about as long as you can get without it starting to get truncated. And for anyone who's following along with this, again, this is, this is in our uh, white paper, so don't worry about furiously taking notes. You'll be able to refer to it later uh, through the MyJSONs mm -hmm. website. Uh, that, that, yeah, so there's also a link at the end of this or uh, I'll tell you where to find some more interesting information yeah. on this stuff from Google. Great. So a bad example there is fairly obvious. It's just a, you know, there's not really that much description going on in there. It's just a fairly generic use of a keyword and you're not really telling the page or the users who see it in the search engines much about this page. The next one up is headers. Now these actually do appear on the site. Now Google uh, will read these and it places more emphasis on them than the regular text on the rest of the page. So we want to make sure that we're using those to actually emphasize the important keywords that are in this content. So for example, we've got the, uh, in the H1 tag, so that's the header one, that's generally the most important heading on the page. You might like to include your target keywords in there. And then in the H2, uh, we can include our secondary target keywords. So maybe that's your hotel or motel name, uh, but also it could be, you, you know, you can mix those two around your H1s and H2s. It may be that you feel that your branding is the more important one to have up the top there. Uh, bad examples, again, just including things like home or uh, phrases that don't include any real descriptive information about the page. So there are Sorry, also I some... Have a yep. question that's just come in relating to that. Um, Lynn, are you online? Nope, okay. I was just about to ask it, I was just waiting for him to stop. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to bring that in? It definitely <laughs> relates to what's being asked now. So yeah, a question that's come in is, um, when using keywords, would you use um, the number two bedroom unit or would you say two bedroom unit as if it was a word? Would you use numbers? Uh, or? Yeah, that's quite a good question actually. Now what I'd probably do is check out the Google keyword tool first. That will give you an idea of what version people are using more. I would say it's likely people are going to be using the numeric two. But that's just a that's a bit of a guess at this stage. So I would yeah I would go with uh, probably the numeric two. Now the good news is, is that Google is actually smart enough to figure out that those two are one and the same. So in most cases, even if you have the number two, it will still sort of link that to the written word two. So there shouldn't be too much confusion between there. You, if you rank for one, you've got a pretty good chance of ranking for the other one as well. Great, thanks. Alright. Uh, so there are other heading levels as well. Um, so H3s and other levels too. Um, generally your H1s and H2s are going to be the most important with H3s sort of being supporting ones. Uh, 
probably the best piece of advice I can give you is that with all of these factors, make sure that you're, they're all pointing towards the same thing. So your H1s should be supporting your title tags, which are being described in your meta description. So that's a good way to think about it. Just make sure they're all helping each other out rather than competing for different phrases. So you wouldn't want to have a description about activities in an area, but have the title tag be about accommodation? No, probably not. You, I mean, you want to have, uh, you know, if you want to describe the activities that are nearby, you feel like that would support your accommodation keywords, then potentially, mm -hmm. but in 160 characters, you probably want to keep it to, you know, the, the really important th things around your keyword. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that finishes up our on-page basic stuff. We've got some advanced on-page stuff as well. So now, like we said before, content or text is what the Googlebot thrives upon. Um, so the Googlebot being the, the search engine spider or the robot that uh, crawls your site and indexes it. Now what we want to do is make sure that our images are correctly tagged. Obviously Google can't read an image. So what we want to do is use the alt attribute um, to describe what's actually appearing in that image. So in this case, let's say your ABC motel again, you would probably want to be, if you've got a picture on your home page of your, uh, of your motel, including a description of it in there like uh, ABC motel in Hamner Springs, that's going to help tell Google exactly what that picture is of, and then it knows that it's not just text on the page that's telling it what it's about, but also the images supporting that same keyword as well. Um, some people c can say that the actual image file names can be uh, helpful there as well. Uh, I probably wouldn't worry about those too much. Uh, it's really the alt attribute that's the more important one there. So some of the other things, as we said, there's 200 different or 200 plus other elements that are being uh, looked at when they're ranking your page. Now, one of the big ones that we've seen in the last year or so is the page load speed. So making sure that your page actually loads quickly for all users. Uh, there was an old saying that, well, an old saying, but it was a saying that we used to have that uh, if you didn't load within the first seven seconds, then you are mo far more likely to have people bouncing away from your site. Now, it's pr with broadband becoming a lot more prominent and a lot of uh, emphasis on page speed, people are probably reducing that down to about three or four seconds. You want to make sure that your, that your page is loading within that time. Now, obviously, Google realizes this, so that's something they're managing now or they're uh, measuring. And if they see that your page takes 10 seconds to load every time, then that's not going to be a very good user experience for the bulk of people. So they're going to start sending people somewhere else. So when Google is measuring this, because let's say I'm someone who is based in my own motel in a faraway town where I have mm -hmm. dial-up. And um, clearly when I'm loading my page, it's going to load slower because I'm on dial-up. Where is Google getting an idea of how fast it's actually loading? So Google has a lot of different data centers and it's pretty much reading from all of those. So it's quite likely that we're getting indexed out of Australia most of the time. Now what they also do is they take into consideration the other sites that are nearby to you or to, that are you know, in your area. So they're able to tell where your site is hosted and where it lives based on uh, your IP address and a bunch of other factors. So they're able to say, okay, so we've got 10 sites that are all targeting Hamina Springs here, uh, accommodation. Now, if these five load faster than the other five, uh, you know, we can say that these are potentially going to be better sites and promote them higher. So it's not like you are going to be disadvantaged because you are um, you, you know, your site's being hosted in New Zealand and the Google bot's located in the States, for example. Okay. Another one there, we're saying use rich media. So there were a bunch of updates to Google's algorithm last year that put a much bigger focus on what content people like and what types of sites people were drawn to. Since then, we've actually started to see that video especially, uh, sites that have video content on them uh, have uh, 
generally ranking better than those that don't. And that includes, you know, so include pictures on your site. Include, if you've got a, the chance, uh, take a quick video, put it up on YouTube and then have it hosted on your own site as well. Uh, it'll make your site more attractive to users, but it also will help show to Google that you've got some good quality content on there. You've got some stuff that's more than just boring old text. You've got pictures. You've got video that people can watch if they want to. Plus, it's probably going to help uh, with the interaction levels on your site as well. So people are actually, you know, people do like to watch video. And if they can see a quick walkthrough or some shots of the inside of uh, some of your rooms, that's going to be a really fantastic way of showing them. So they know what to expect before they book. This is a really great point you're making, Simon. And actually, um, this year, Jason's has expanded our offering with our virtual videos to, um, previously, we always had our, uh, the video, virtual videos made, and then they would sit in your listing on Jason's site. But for the first time this year, we've um, changed our method of making them so that our operators who subscribe to a virtual video not only get to have it on their site, but they can use it in any of their marketing, on their website, on YouTube, anywhere, and they can embed it as they like as part of their marketing plan. So that's really exciting to hear. Yeah, it's it's becoming a it's becoming a much bigger part of what we do. Uh, SEO used to be just about looking at the text, but it's now content as a whole. So yeah, having access to that's really fantastic. Yeah. Um, the last point we've got here is sitemaps and robot.txt files. Now these are files that are used by Google or by search engines to figure out exactly what pages there are on your site and what they're allowed to access, what they should be accessing. So the sitemaps, uh, a sitemap generally will be done in XML and what it is is a list of all of the different pages along with things like the priority that you've placed on them, the change frequency so, or, and when they were last updated. Now Google can read through that and say, hey, actually I've got these five pages, but these other five I didn't have in my index previously. So it can find those and go directly to them rather than having to crawl through all the links on your site. Um, and the robots.txt file is, uh, it pretty much has information on where to find the sitemaps file, but also some other things like, um, you know, if you don't want to, uh, Google to index certain areas, then that's a really uh, great way of, of sort of limiting its access or making sure that it does have access in different uh, through that file. Um, previously, I'd mentioned that th there is a document later on in this presentation from Google uh, that has some SEO recommendations in it. That goes into really good coverage of the sitemaps and robots.txt files. So if you want some more information on that, uh, check the white paper or uh, so to get that link to that file. Um, it's a really good read and an interesting stuff going on in there. Great. <clears throat> okay, so we've talked about some of the technical elements, but we've also been starting to talk about content. Now, this is a really hard one um, for, for, for a lot of people to get their head around. Now, when we're generating content, we want to make sure that we're writing content for people and not for robots. So uh, that picture there is actually uh, how Google sort of displays its own Google bots. Um, <laughs> as you can see, it's a fairly friendly looking guy in that one. Um, but we want to make sure... It doesn't read like the rest of us because all of us have seen pages that are written like they're written for robots. That's right. So. It used to be, yeah, SEO has really evolved. It used to be that there was a lot, a way that we could sort of stuff keywords into the page. And the more times you had a keyword appearing, the better you would rank. Now, we want to make sure that we're writing for people. Uh, as of an update that was actually called the Panda update of February last year, Google has started to identify what people like as opposed to what it itself likes. Now, it uses a whole lot of data to figure that out, but yeah, it grabs, uh, what people are interested and then multiplies that out across all of the other sites so it can say, okay, this your site is similar to this other site that people really liked or really read. You know, they read all of the content on it. So we can assume that your site is also going to be good and something that they're interested in. 
as soon as we start writing for actual, well, just for the search robots, then we start making it more difficult for people to read. So the way to do th <laughs> the way to do that is actually to um, think about what users really want to know. We're going to want to, you know, support all of the pages that we want with good text. Uh, we generally recommend a couple of hundred words um, on on every page. At, so, but if you need to write a lot more than that, or you don't think it, you know, needs that much to explain it, then that's quite all right. Now, we will include keywords where appropriate. Um, but really, we want to think about what users want to know about your, you know, your hotel, motel, and answer their questions. So, if you're so running that, a bed and breakfast, you might say what kind of breakfast you're offering, in addition to what you're close to, and all of those things. Yeah, definitely. And this is the time when we start to think about the activities that are nearby, or all of those other, um, all of those those other interesting things that people want to know. So how would I get uh, to the airport or you know to how would I get from the airport to your accommodation? Um, anything you know what happens if I if I can't make it there on time and it's outside of it, uh, office hours? All of those different elements we need to think about what if you were a user and you were thinking of coming to stay with you what would you want to know? What would be the important things that you'd need to know before you'd say, yes, that's the place I want to stay? Got it. So when we start writing content like that, it's not only going to be good for the users, it's also going to be thematically relevant. So what that means is generally when Google's figuring out what a page is about, it uses not only the keywords that we're focusing on, but all of the keywords around it that help support show what that page is about. So by just writing naturally and writing about yourselves, you're going to produce better content for what Google wants. We want to be adding new content all the time. Um, so ideally having a blog or similar is going to be a really good way of doing that. So just, you know, even if it's a couple of times a month or, you know, just every so often, we want to make sure that there's some new content for Google to index, for Google to read, and also for our users to have a look at. It shows that the site is active and it hasn't just been sort of set up five years ago and abandoned. We want to make sure that it's always up to date. So what kind of stuff would an accommodation operator put on a blog? Well, they could write about pretty much anything they really want to. Um, I mean, we'd recommend activities or events that are Special going on speed. in the local area. Yeah, so um, even what you're seeing, I mean, the Rugby World Cup provided about, you know, 100, <laughs> 100 years worth of content for the people that mm -hmm. were blogging about that. But, yeah, generally any events that are going on, any local... Um, local news that might be relevant for travellers, um, updates to your business. So you might say, hey, we're going through our, you know, we, we've just finished renovating these rooms. Here are some photos of before and after. Let's show everyone how nice they are now. All of those different things can be included. Great. Um, and finally, we want to write content that will attract links. So this brings us on to the link building section. Now I'm going to have to start flying through this fairly quickly because we're running out of time and I want to answer some questions. But links are pretty much like votes um, on the internet. So the more links that you have, in Google's eyes, the more votes that you have that your site is good quality or is high authority. Now these votes contribute to something called PageRank. Now PageRank is pretty much the authority value that Google has assigned to your individual pages and to your site. So the higher your page rank value is, the better off you are. If you want to find out what your page rank is, you can have a look on the, uh, you know, just jump into Google and search for a page rank checker, uh, put in your URL and that'll tell you exactly what your page rank is. So it's, a, it's also a rank from 1 to 10 and it's a, um, logarithmic one, so it's actually, it's a lot more difficult to get from a 5 to a 6, for example, than from a 1 to a 2. And Simon, if you have people that are linking to your site that have high page rank, what does that do? So what it is, is the value or a portion of their page rank, so they're obviously higher authority people, a portion of their page rank is passed along to you. 
So the higher the page or the higher the page rank of the site that's linking to you, the better or the better that link is for your site. Okay. So it, big sites, if you can get big sites to like Jason's or Expedia or whatever Amazon, you know, if you're a shop, if you're a store to link to you, then that's feeding you good page rank. That's right. That's exactly right. So what we'll generally recommend for the local people especially, because this will help with your rankings um, targeting specific areas, uh, all those longer tail phrases we talked about, focus on um, talk or on contacting your local directories, any related businesses. So let's say um, you know, you, you've got somebody down, you, you've got an activity down the road that you send a lot of people their way and they send some people your way when people contact them. You can always have links pointing to and from each other's sites to help bolster your, both of your page ranks. Um, and also, uh, Lara, you had a couple of other sites or specifics that you thought would be worth mentioning here? Yeah, um, from what I see here, you know, we've got links, but there has to be something specific about these links, isn't it? Don't you need to be targeting keywords in the links, or is there something about that that we needed to go through? Yeah, that, that's yeah. also worth considering. Ideally, I mean, all links are going to be valuable to you, but the most valuable ones are going to be the ones that actually have the keywords in the anchor text. So the text that the link says, uh, if that reflects your keywords, so Hamner Springs Motel, Rotorua Hotel, whatever it was, if that's, uh, you know, if that's actually using the keywords when they're linking to you, that's going to be the most effective link you can have. So shy away from click here. Yeah, that's the one. So that example that we had earlier in the presentation was a terrible example. Um, it, oh, it's, it's what not to do. Uh, yeah. So it, yeah, the anchor text actually helps, sh again, it's helping show what your page is about. And again, I the, the, I have the, a, sorry, what? Sorry, um, I have a question from the floor actually. Mm -hmm. um, just a question um, has been asked, and uh, that they've been uh, told that there's a. It's better to link to sites that are not linked back, i.e., one-way link. Um, yes, that is true. So if you get links from, if you can get one-way links, and they do carry more value than what we call reciprocal linking, so pointing back and forth. Now. Unfortunately, it's a lot harder to get one-way links um, because generally people want something in return for them if you're trying to build them manually. If they come around organically or naturally, people are doing them, then that's fantastic. But if you're linking back to the uh, other site, then it does diminish the value a little bit. That's not to say that it's, it's completely worthless. It's just not as valuable as a direct one-way link. So on this link topic, I imagine if I'm if I'm a small property and I you know I have maybe a four or five page website, my and I haven't been around that long, my page page rank is going to be you know one two maybe three at maximum, but if I have listings on lots of sites, whether they are booking sites, travel media sites, they my RTO site, all sending link juice, I guess is what they call it, my way, then that's yep. going to help build my page rank, right? Exactly. And so just getting out there in as many sort of uh, places as you can. So even, um, yeah, e e even local directories or anything like that is going to help. Or Jason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or Jason's okay. is going to help drive some of that page rank value or the, that link juice back to you. And it's going to help your rankings. All right, so that brings us to social sharing. So um, users are likely to share content um, if, if it's good quality. So by making it, we want to make sure that we're producing content that people are interested in or going to want to share, but we also want to make it easy for people to share this. So it might be that you put your own like button. You know, if you have a presence on Facebook, you can put the like button on your own page. Or alternatively, you can use a service like Add This, which uh, puts a bunch of little icons like that. You just copy and paste the code onto your own site, uh, and that will include those on there, and it'll make it easy for people to share them using social networks or share your content via social networks. Now, again, this is not something that's as important as linking or on page at the moment, but in the future, this is something that Google is obviously trying to uh, become a lot or make a lot more put a lot more focus on, generally. 
So Can yeah, it's worth saying it. something about how not all search results are the same. And I'm yeah. thinking about yeah, well, well, I'm thinking about the search page, and I know that when I search for certain things, I get some answers. But when I come back to work and I search for the same thing, I can't always find the same answers in my search page. Can yep. you tell us a little bit more about that? Yep, that actually brings us on quite nicely to what to watch out for. So as you were saying, not all search results are created equal. Um, now what this means is that generally if I am searching for something, um, I'm going to see completely different results to what you are. So based on my search history, based on what Google and what other search engines know about me, um, based on where I live, what I've searched for, what social networks I'm signed up for, and all the visibility they have through those, they're going to customize your results just for you. So they might determine that when I'm searching for, um, uh, you know, I'm searching for accommodation in Auckland, I'm more relevant. I'm more likely to want it in one particular part of Auckland rather than another, and so it will continue to evolve my search results or change the results that I personally see based on that. What it also means is that um, if if you are a you know if you're an operator and you're searching for your own location frequently, so if you are ABC Motel and you're constantly searching for Hamner Springs accommodation, um, if you're always clicking on your own results or you're clicking on yours more than one of the others, it's going to start prioritizing your site in your own rankings. So you've got to be a little bit careful. You might see that your site starts jumping to the top, but if you look at it on another computer, that's not going to be the case. It's going to be, uh, it's going to look completely different. So it's important to remember that, yeah, those results are not the same for everyone. And how do you know where you're ranking overall then? Um, that's <laughs> it's quite a tricky question. Um, there are some tools out there that will allow you to check your rankings from a neutral location or a, you know, a, a ranking without, without any of the personalization or the social factors applied. Uh, you're probably just best off jumping into Google and doing a quick search for um, a keyword ranking tool. That will, you punch your keyword and your site name into those and it'll tell you based on what it sees is the current ranking for your website. Okay. So a couple of other little things. Um, don't overdo your SEO. I mean obviously we don't want to over optimize any of our content because that'll start to look unnatural and Google doesn't like that. And finally, avoid the dark side. So we talked earlier about how there is um, you know, a lot of negative press around what SEO is. And that's generally because what a lot of people do, or, or some people do, is they turn towards what's called black hat SEO, or as, as we've called it here, the dark side. Now what it is, is um, it's manipulation uh, or illegal manipulation from Google's point of view. Google wants you to make your site better and to help optimize your content. What they don't want is for you to try to manipulate the results that people are seeing. So no gaming the system. Exactly. Now it does tend to generate short term results quite quickly, um, but you will get penalized for it in the long run. And when your site disappears off Google completely, you're, yeah, you're going to find really hard to find any new business when people can't see you at all. Pretty much Google is the internet for a lot of people now. So if you can't be found there or if you're being penalized and have had your website removed, you're really going to suffer for it. So do, stay away from the dark side. So better, better to take the long, slow road to the top. Exactly. There's, there's, there's no quick and easy wins here um, that'll stick, stick around forever, unfortunately. So what next? Uh, as we mentioned, that Google SEO starter guide. If you do a search for that um, in Google, then you'll come up with it. Or alternatively, uh, check out the white paper. It'll have a listing in there. Um, have a read over that. I th it, it's, it's quite a long document, actually. From memory, it's about 30 or 40 pages. Uh, but it's got a lot of really good information. It, it's a good basic uh, or beginner's guide to SEO. Plus you're going to, because it's released by Google, you're going to be making sure that you're keeping them happy and you're not straying into that black area or that dark area. So it's a really good place to start reading up. I'd really recommend having a uh, look at it. Cool. 
Well, Simon, if you'd like to flip to the final slide, um, we've got about five minutes left to take questions. And just as a quick drop in for me so that we can just drop into questions. And if the time runs out, then we can close quickly. Uh, just a reminder to everyone who's attending, the white papers for this are available at myjasons.co.nz and will be up tomorrow um, on that site. We will also follow this session with an email to everyone who has attended with um, a link to a feedback survey and also a link to the recording of the webinar. Um, Lynn, if you'd like to move into questions, I see we have quite a few in the queue there. Yeah, um, there's just um, some more clarification there, Simon, on what exactly the dark side is. What practices would be seen as the dark side? Um, the most common one is probably paid linking. So when you're buying links uh, for the purpose of manipulating the search results, but there's a whole lot of other things like keyword stuffing, cloaking. I mean, people take it to extremes to the point where they hack into sites to make, you know, to force links to appear on them back to your own site. Um, the main one, main one is going to be manipulative linking, though. Okay. Um, next question is more about sort of site maintenance. In terms of putting in these links into your own site, how do you go about doing that if it's not your site? You if it's not. Into other people's sites, generally it'll be a matter of talking to the web to their webmasters. So it might just be an email if it's somebody local that you know. If it's a directory, then generally they'll have their own sort of submission areas. Um, if it's someone like Jason's, then it comes as part of the package. So your link will show up when you send the send the data through to them. Um, but a lot of the time, it's just getting out and talking to people, whether that's by email or picking up the phone and giving them a call. Um, if you've got yeah local people that you want to start a, a bit of a link building network with, then that's a great way to do it. So if there's a jet boat operator in your town, they might have suggested places to stay in our area, and then they might link to you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you could just um, drop them an email that says, hey, how's it going? Um, I've noticed you've got this area of your site, but you don't have us on there. We'd be really grateful if you did include us. Um, and that's about all there is to it. So, you know, just by getting in touch with them, you're likely to uh, jump on and get that link. Okay, great. I think I'm just reading through um, I noticed one here. It says that um, you didn't mention the keywords tag, Simon. Do you think that this is not so important for SEO anymore? Ah, good catch. So somebody's uh, been paying attention. So the keywords tag is no longer used by major search engines. Um, now, I, I, now Bing has just come out recently and confirmed that they use it as a negative ranking factor. So if you try to over-optimize this area, then they will penalize you, but they don't use it for positive rankings gains anymore. So we don't actually bother with it. If you are going to use it, put a couple of keywords in there. It's kind of like the meta description tag that we use, just put a couple of keywords in, um, but don't put a lot of effort into it because it's just it was too easy to manipulate so people so the engines don't use it anymore. Mm, very interesting. Okay, I think we've I think we've covered off everything from what I can see. Great. Well then thank you very much everyone. Thank you Lynn. Lynn is the marketing segment manager at Jason's Travel Media and she does a lot of the communications that go between um, you are operators and the company. I am Laura Ortiz, the marketing manager at Jason's, and that was Simon Laird from First Rate. Uh, if you have any questions at all after this event, uh, feel free to email helpdesk at jasons.com or visit the My Jason's page. Alternatively, you can also call 0800 Jason's. And uh, thank you very much for your business. Great, and I'll end the webinar for everybody now, counting you out. Four, three, two, one, have a great afternoon.